it's simple. I mean, too many smart people struggle to speak with confidence. This is me before an investor presentation, freaking out and trying to memorize my slides. It's the non-native English speaker, the immigrant, the engineer who's stuck in their job, not getting a promotion because their manager says they need to speak with confidence. It's the woman who gets talked over in corporate America. It's any of us. We've needed this at some point in our lives. We know 20 people who need it right now. You're listening to What Fuels You, where we deep dive with CEOs, entrepreneurs, and business leaders to learn more about their stories and uncover nuggets of wisdom we can all use. I'm your host, Shauna Swirland, CEO of Fuel Talent, an award-winning recruiting firm based in Seattle. Today's guest on the What Fuels You podcast is Varun Puri. Varun is the co-founder of Udly, an AI-powered communication coach. Udly helps you ace your next presentation or interview by providing private and judgment-free analytics on your filler words, body language, content, and more. Udly is being rolled out to 300,000 Toastmaster members globally. They've raised $7 million in funding, and they've been featured across media outlets such as The Wall Street Journal and Inc. Before Udly, Varun led Africa operations for Google X initiative that used invisible lasers to bring the internet to unconnected areas. He also ran special projects for Sergey Brin, one of Google's founders. Varun is a TEDx speaker, part of Forbes 30 Under 30, was voted the best young entrepreneur in the Pacific Northwest, and gave the commencement speech at Claremont McKenna College, his alma mater. Welcome, Varun. So good to see you. Thank you. Thank you. It's an honor to be here. I loved, I told you this right before we got on to the recording, but I just love Voodly. I'm so excited. Are you, I said Voodly, Yudli. I'm so excited for our um, listeners to learn more because all of us can use this. I was saying that our candidates that fuel should all be using Yudli before they go on interviews. And um, there's so many use cases that I got so excited. I almost was like, can I come work for you? It was a very cool company. Y'all are doing way more interesting things, but I am uh, humbled you would think so. So massive, thank you. I don't know about that. Okay, I'm hitting you with some rapid fire. This one's a hard one off out of the gate, but I'm just curious. Do you have a favorite quote or anything that you live by that you kind of mantra? This one's very cheesy. Uh, short answer is I live in these cliched punchlines. So I always uh, have like a favorite quote and inspiration. Oh, perfect. Great. Mine is, the sky is the view, not the limit. And the reason I love it is far too often we say, well, the sky's the limit. I disagree. Um, There's no limit to how much we can dream. Uh, If we have a shot, we've got to shoot it. And we can keep shooting it to infinity. I've never even actually heard that one. Is that your quote or is that someone else's quote? No, it's probably someone famous and important, but I've just (laughs) been... You're famous and important. Um, What is the first thing that you do when you wake up? Do not look at my phone. go to the restroom and then get on my bike and get on a bike ride. My goal is to not look at my phone. Yeah, it's not look at the phone until I'm in office. Oh, you're so good. I've literally had that on my kind of goal to-do list and it just doesn't happen. It's the first thing I do and I, you're so good. I love that. Um, Okay, well, this is a perfect next question. Where is your dream place to go with your bike? Like any country in the world, any bike ride? It's funny you asked because two days ago, I went to Hawaii to do a big bucket list, right? So Mauna Kea is uh, the world's largest mountain base to peak. So I rode that. It was awesome. It was miserable. The next one, I have two. I want to ride the East Coast of Australia and I want to go do some of the Tour de France rides in Europe. So you're road and mountain? No, I'm road. Oh, you're road. So the Mauna Kea one was road. It was road and there's a section of just brutal gravel that I suffered. Yeah, that's what I my, thought. I've heard about that. My I have, yeah. bike with big tires. Interesting. Okay. Um, what are three words that uh, your team would use to describe you as a leader? Impulsive. Vulnerable. I hope kind. But I'm impulsive sure. was the first one that came to mind and I'm 100% sure of that. You're impulsive to say the word impulsive. (laughs) There we go. And what about your friends? What would the three words be for them? Impulsive, spontaneous, and waffy. So waffy is this cheesy thing in our friend group that stands for what are friends for? 
WAF is just this card that you can pull out anytime, right? Like if my friend calls me and WAFs me, it doesn't matter if I'm on a date, board meeting, important discussion, I've just got to drop everything and be there for them. That's like a, a, a cheat code for uh, SOS. I love that. Can I steal it? Absolutely. I've been trying to make it a movement forever, but it's just not catching on beyond. Well, my- just let's go. What do we hashtag Waffy? I'm I'm like old lady compared to you. So you have to tell me what to do. Hashtag Waff. Uh, what up? Hashtag Waff. Okay. There you go. I love it. Um, what is your biggest pet peeve? People speaking more uh, than they listen. It's also something that I'm acutely aware of in myself. They say that we uh, are annoyed by the things that we're annoyed with in ourselves. So now I have to be sure that I'm not talking too much. No, but that's the irony. <laughs> On this podcast, I'm supposed to talk more. So I'm more aware of it. But I have you in the background and I'm trying to keep my talk time at 60%. Let's see. Well, no, you're supposed to talk more on this one. Um, since it just came out, I'm not sure if you're a, a big music lover, but I am. And I'm curious what your top five artists are in your Spotify list. Ooh, that's such a good question. It, honestly, it varies. So Taylor Swift was in town. So I was obviously binging a bunch of her stuff and I went to her concert. I've been listening to a lot of um, upcoming Hindi music recently. Um, Here's a really cheesy one. Basically, Startup Life is punching me in the face. Every day I take a new hit. But I have all of these cheesy Disney songs that I used to pump me up. Like Shakira has this one called Try Everything from the movie Zootopia. Or another. Uh, there's another one by Sia that's not Disney. That's Unstoppable. And I listen to that on drives to my board meeting. So my current oh my genre gosh. is pick me up songs with meaningful lyrics. It's like... Um, okay, I'm writing that down because I love that kind of stuff too. Music for me is everything as far as putting me into a mindset. Do you listen to music when you ride your bike? Or I guess you can't really do that since you're outside. No, no, no. I do that all the time. Uh, music and books, yeah. Audio books. Wow. Do you ever ride on Mercer Island? Yeah, all the time. That's okay, like my I'm next over here. So you have to tell me when you come, I'll meet you for your apre, whatever, beer or coffee or whatever you do. Listen, I have no shame. Um, we work with we work with you all for, to get our candidates and your team will tell you that as well. So careful what you offer up. <laughs> oh, I'm all about it. I'm super excited to meet up with you. Um, I'm curious because you've had such an incredible story so far and you're so young, you've got so much ahead of you. But when you were a kid and you think back, who was your hero? Growing up, my dad, for sure. My dad is a smarter, adulter, more respectful, more mature version of me. My name is Varun. His name is Tarun. He's lived in countries all around the world, like um, Indonesia, um, Milan, whatever, Bali, Jakarta, Milan, Amsterdam, Portland. And I'm just like, it's made him so worldly. And anything that I do well, he does a million times better. So I keep looking up to him. And what did he do or what does he do that took you guys all over the world, took him all over the world? Yeah, so I I didn't grow up with him. Uh, My parents are divorced, but I'm very close to my parents. He worked at a bunch of MNCs and just adventured. I want to be him. That's always been my dream. And I'm like, maybe there's still time, but I've lived in three cities. But to live in all those different countries, it's so true. We all need that to get, especially like the empathy for how everyone thinks among different cultures. But you grew up, I read that you went to high school in New Delhi. Is that right? Yeah. And how would you describe your earliest years? I also read that in middle school, you had a lisp that to me is perfect for you, and we'll get into it. Um, but did that, were you like confident? And and that was like kind of a little thing that impacted you? Because you come off extremely confident oh, really? in, a good, in a good way, in a good way. Oh, shoot. Okay. I mean, me in high school was what you'd expect of most high schoolers. Awkward, slightly arrogant, a mess, not knowing what I want a dorky chess player, but never good enough. Um, I was a little insecure of my lisp when I had it in middle school, but I was always like uh, a big talker. Again, I'm trying to listen more than I speak. I think I was like any awkward teenager still figuring things out. The only problem is I'm still the same, just slightly older. (laughs) I think it's even harder now. I have three teenagers and I, I think it's very difficult now to be a teenager because every single thing is, you know, real time recorded and they're so um, confident despite it all, but I don't know how kids today are dealing. Um, so chess, who taught you how to play chess? It's interesting. My mom took me for my first class. My mom and I took our first chess class together and then I just loved it. Um, you know, you can get immersed in on the board forever. 
I felt like I was learning with every new move. So I, I got really deep into chess. I played very competitively to the point where, where I got quite good, but not good enough to do that full time. Uh, and chess is just my happy thing now. When I'm sad, when I've had a bad day, when I'm low, I just play on the side. Do you play online? Yeah. That's great. My the, it, ch- Chess is very popular right now among teenagers. I don't know if you know that. Um, my running joke is, so you know, there's this Netflix show called Queen's Gambit. Yes, I was going to ask you if you've seen it. I was so into that. It's so frustrating. Essentially, in school, I used to play chess and all the cool kids used to haze me and make fun of me because like, you know, the cool the cool guys that play cricket and soccer. And then, you know, there was a girl who was cute and she'd ask me, Varun, what do you do for fun? And I'm like, I play chess. That would just end things. Yeah, you're like, and game over. <laughs> and game over. And then this Queen's Gambit show comes out and now chess is suddenly the cool thing to do. And I'm like, I was cool before it became cool. Yeah, you're like, I, I was a fair. visionary back then. It's and so what, were, what were your superpowers? It sounds like not getting ladies was not a superpower. I'm not getting kidding. ladies was a superpower for sure. Um, I think similar to now, um, I'm super dreamy, which means I'm a little delusional and devoid of reality at times. Uh, and I would shoot my shot, be it with you know the opportunity to come to the US or to try something new or to go for a chess tournament, debate tournament, whatever. Yeah. And and you went to Claremont McKenna College, part of the Claremont schools. It's, I, you know, I grew up in the U.S. and Claremont's such an incredible school. But how did it even get on your radar from New Delhi? What was your process like to research colleges? Yeah, it's super interesting that you ask because nobody back home knows what Claremont McKenna is. It's a small liberal arts college. Back home, brand names are everything. I was hoping to get into one of the flashy sounding schools. I got rejected from all of them. The way I got here was... First, I wasn't smart enough to get into any of the engineering colleges in India. So that helped downsize a lot. Second, I had come to the US for a couple of summer programs. And I was just like, this is incredible. You know, you're 17 and you can just dream. You want to uh, start a debate club? You can do that. You want to join an intramural league? You've got opportunities. You want to do Model UN? There are just ways to do it here. And we didn't have those opportunities back home. Um, so there's an organization in India that helped sponsor me and come here. And my parents were willing to help out as well. And that's what brought me to the U.S. And can you tell me a little bit more about New Delhi? I'm always fascinated by um, just culture and also just geography, like where people are from and and trying to kind of close my eyes and picture what a childhood would be like there. A good way of th- So Delhi's the capital of India. It's in the north. Think of it as a lot going on at all times. There's lots of sounds and smells and people and noises um, and excitement. It's the thing about India that really sticks out to me is the warmth and hospitality. And I struggled with that in the US. Look, I love life in the US, but it's still very individualistic. It's like me and maybe my nuclear family and you know my job in India, your success is how your family is doing and your broader community. And there's no concept of, oh, you bought me this banana. Let me Venmo you. Things are shared. Um, and that's what a lot of upbringing was like. And, and it's something that I'm battling right now, right? Figuring out life in the US while also maintaining my Indian values. This quarter life crisis is hard. <laughs> it doesn't end. Sorry to share with you. No, but they call it quarter life. So I figured like, you know, when you turn 30 or 35, it's no longer quarter. So then you're cruising. No, then you have a whole new set of shit that you're dealing with. Yeah. Yeah. So I like to hear about it because I think that some of these values are, are, I agree with you, are lost. And even as an American, I would say that they're lost and they're so deeply rooted in various countries and they're so beautiful. Um, So I like to learn and I think it's important for people to keep those values in mind when dealing with other people. How does that shape you when you think about how you want to impact um, your community, your company, your culture, your friends? Oh, that's a loaded question. I think in two ways. The first is I'm building Udly to help kids in India speak with confidence. I hope we make a lot of money in the process. Um, but that's what gets me out of bed. And I think if we build something that can help folks who never had the opportunity to learn to communicate, um, empower themselves, that's really powerful. And I want to do that forever. The second piece of it is in my day to day, this backfires like eight out of 10 times. I'm very much the guy where you give me a fist bump or a handshake, that just means everything, right? Like you give me a word, you're joining done. We've said we are going to um, 
figure out a way to solve a problem together. I don't care what like the paperwork says or what like the legal agreement is. Uh, it's very much a matter of principle. But I'm realizing corporate world doesn't always work like that. So I oftentimes see myself in this uncomfortable situation. Yeah. I have a couple of relatives um, who remind me of you when they're talking about dealing in business, that they, they're they old school. They believe in the handshake. They believe in the word. And not everybody's like that. And so, I yeah, I have a lot to say about that. But I think that that is also something that's kind of lost. That let's just, you know, do what we say, say what we mean. mean You know, it's it's... Yes, 100% agree with you. So we, getting back to Claremont, so you decided on Claremont because you're flipping yourself shit basically and saying that you didn't get into these other schools, which it sounds like I can't tell you how many people on this podcast have uh, kind of sold themselves in that way, which as a mother of someone who's in college and another one that's about to apply, you realize like it kind of matters, doesn't matter. Like some of these other qualities are really, really important, like drive and focus. And like you said, the dreaminess, um, but out of all the schools that you had as your choices, how did you choose Claremont? Luckily it was easy because I didn't have too many choices. Claremont was no brainer out of the ones I got into, but Claremont was super. I mean, it's a small liberal arts college. I came to the U S on my own last at 17. Like they nurtured me and helped me figure out my identity um, there are only 300 people in our class, so we all got really close together, right? The people you party with the night before, you see in the morning, and then you see the same person hungover in class, and then you're doing mock trial with them together. We all got really close, and I don't know what it's like for other immigrants, but for me, coming here at the time that I did, I think I needed some TLC, and Claremont was exactly the place to do it, and it's a super school, super curriculum, 20 out of 10 would recommend to anyone. One of my good friends from high school went there and loved it. And did you, when you say that it was an easy, easier transition than possibly for other immigrants, was, was it a time in your life where you were looking for, I got to find some other people from India to just have some sort of, some sort of comfort or were you like, okay, like cold Turkey, I'm going to try to immerse myself completely in a new culture. More the latter, actually. I think a lot of my friends who went to bigger schools tend to be lost because where do you belong? And then you stick to folks from back home. Because I was trying to find my identity at a time when I had just moved to the US and there were very few Indians at Claremont, I became close to folks I would not otherwise hang out with. And we just aligned on the value stuff. You know, a running joke I have is my college roommate I enter and it's just this yeah I'm small skinny Indian guy coming with braces and like you know shy and scared and I just see this massive shirt hanging in my room I'm like oh my god what's going on and then this guy rolls through and he's like six two jacked football player and like American football not my kind of football his name's Tyler and he just rolls in with the entire football team and I'm like oh my god I'm going to get beaten up like I've watched movies where they take the little Indian boy put him against a locker and go boom 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 Anyhow, long story short, Tyler is my bestest friend in the world. We roomed together all four years. In fact, we roomed in a double all four years. And like a lot of my Claremont stories are stories like that, where I just became close to folks I would never otherwise hang out with. That's amazing. And such an inspiration. Um, Yeah, I love that story. And were you thinking when you came, like, I'm going to go to college for four years and then come back to India? Or was was there a thought around uh, what to do? after school? The thought was first, let me get out of Claremont, right? I got rejected by all these colleges. I'm going to do a semester here and then apply. I didn't end up doing it. I fell in love with Claremont. I don't think I had a strong opinion one way or another. I, at the core, back then and even now, I want to do something that's India focused at all times, no matter what. Like that's where my home is, my values are. But wherever there's a fun opportunity, I'm happy to go there. Um, but I want to travel more. Like Talking about my dad's story, I want to spend more time in different countries, and I haven't done enough of that yet. Yeah. And what did you end up studying? I Studying is a strong term. I didn't study enough in Claremont, but I graduated with a degree in economics, but like bare bones degree. Yeah. My son's at Amherst College, and he went there to study economics, and it's tough. Econ's tough. I mean, Amherst is very much like Claremont. It's a yeah. small liberal arts college. He's probably having a blast. Yeah, he is. He's loving it you hear about some of these other schools that you're talking about, the shiny, you know, flashy schools. 
where investment banking and you know consulting come on campus and recruit out. Did that happen at Claremont? And it sounds like tech. I mean, you went right into tech. Did you know that was the direction you wanted to go? No, not at all. I mean, I think a lot of the liberal arts colleges have a strong consulting finance ba- banking program. I fell into tech. Uh, Intuit had you know this like hackathon event. My actually no, my freshman year, Infosys, which is a large company in India had this really cool internship program where they bring folks from around the world, like students from NCAD and HBS, et cetera, and bring them to the Infosys headquarter for the summer. And I ended up doing that. And I was like, this is so cool. And then my sophomore year into it had this hackathon on campus. And I was like, that's awesome. We ended up doing that. That converted to a sophomore year internship in the Valley. And I was hooked on the energy and the dreaminess over there. And then I was like, I want to be back here. So, Okay. I am just curious how you ended up because you're so young and I know you spent a lot of your career, you were at Google and I read and obviously reported directly to Sergey Brin, like how many people can say that? How did all that go down? It was very random is the honest answer. So I did the Intuit stuff, did a Google summer internship, was a blast. I was one of those interns wearing those weird hats with the fan on top, very spoiled, partying away. It was great. Joined Google right after college in one of these early grad rotational programs and got tapped by uh, the lady who who runs culture at Google, Stacy. She's awesome and said, look, Sergey wants to chat with you. And I met with Sergey and essentially he was saying, look, this Google thing's gotten really big. We are now building Alphabet. Have you seen the show Silicon Valley? And I was like, yes, I have. And there's this character named Jared in the show Silicon Valley. Are you familiar with him? Of course. So Jared is just this dorky guy who like cleans up the trash and writes a business plan and is like chief of staff to the CEO guy. Um, and Sergey was like, Varun, I'm looking for my Jared from the show Silicon Valley. And I was like, Sergey, I hope I'm not as dorky, but I'm young, naive and indestructible. Take a bet on me. Uh, so my role was to be a fixer, essentially. It wasn't assistant. It wasn't chief of staff. I didn't have a team. Sergey was doing his own things. I was the only person reporting to him. And it was just to be his hands and ears wherever needed. So every Monday, I would give him a report on, you know, the little guy's take on what's happening at Alphabet. He would have one-off projects, like he's going to Davos. What are, what should his, should his talking points be? So then I'd run around and talk to someone important in the comms team and get, get that info for him. Um, it was an incredible role. I think I got the exposure to how Alphabet works at a seven-dimensional level how important the human element is, you know, and I think about companies, I'm like, well, there was this one strategic plan and led to five strategic plans. It's not true. It's like people trying things, just being humans at the top. Um, Yeah, it was an awesome opportunity, learned a lot. Tell me what are some of the key things that you learned there? During my time at Google or during the Sergey gig? Well, I mean, I'm kind of laser focused for some reason on the Sergey gig because it is, um, I think an incredibly important role for high level executives to think about just that person. that's like the data dump of, um, and some key executives that we work with have this person. And I think that's a miss to not have this type of person that's smart and hungry and humble. And I'm curious what you took away from, I guess, maybe his leadership style and the culture overall. It's a good question. So here are examples of the kinds of things I learned. First off, it was incredibly lonely. And I was speaking to all of these role models, right? Folks I read about at Forbes, Wall Street Journal, et cetera. And I got to meet a lot of folks, some of whom were beyond inspiring. And I was like, oh my gosh, when I grow up, I want to be like you. I can see how you're in this position. Some of whom were just mean. Like, because I was a little guy, they would you know, talk to me a certain way or push me around. And I was like, Hey, if I'm ever a big dog, like I want to remember how to treat the little guy. So that human connection was very important. The second was, you know, I couldn't provide to Sergey any novel insights or information. I'm like 22, right out of college. What do I know? Every Monday, I would give him a state of the union of what's going on across the other bets. So the way Alphabet is structured is Google is kind of the alpha bet. And then there are other bets, Wing, Verily, Calico, uh, or Google X, all of these other companies. And my role was to just give Sergey my candid take on what's going on at the other companies. There I learned how in a one pager do I 
effectively tell him the things that I think are most important that are going on across the company. Now, I could talk about revenue projections and what I heard at some board meeting, but he already has that information. And quite frankly, that's likely not why he hired me. Again, this is me looking back. It was to give him insights that nobody else would. Hey, Sergey, did you know this happened at the company? Just a fun fact. Oh, by the way, employees are chatting about this uh, at another stage in the company. And I realized owning the things that I had a unique vantage point on, which was what's going on at the other bets that nobody will either have the courage to tell you or think is important enough to tell you, like, let me own that. And I think that helped me learn what information to convey to whom and when. Um, and that was pretty much it. Um, those, are incre- those are incredible things to learn, but did people start to treat you differently? Yes and no. I mean, it was really flashy on the outside, right? I'm the only person at the company reporting to Sergey. I'm not Sergey. I don't control anything. A lot of people reached out to me trying to get in touch with him. That felt kind of sad at times. And I felt like a little pawn in this weird chessboard. Uh, but the, but I also got to meet a lot of folks who would never otherwise take my call. And that was incredible. Uh, and I think that got me to dream saying like, hey, all of them have started companies. At some point, I want to give this a shot as well. Like shame on me if yeah. I'm the guy who becomes a director at 30 at Google. Not that I was going to, but like that's not the dream I want to live. I've had this incredible opportunity. Let me go and try and shoot my shot with it. Would you say that you've always had the entrepreneurial bug? And at what point did you make the decision to make the transition? I don't, I was unclear through researching like how you even um, made the transition, like to Al- how did you meet Allen Institute, all of that. So did the Sergey role was based out of Google X. Google X is an incredible place. There are robots and drones and scientists and physicists, and it's just a dream place to be. I really wanted to land a job at X, but I had like four fewer PhDs than required. Sergey was awesome and said, hey, find a project that you like and we'll help you out. There was a a guy named Mahesh, who's one of my mentors, coming up with this idea to bring internet to rural India using invisible lasers. I was like, Mahesh, that sounds like the dream. If I can go home and see my mom, um, you know, five times a year on Google's time and work on this incredible project that's super technical, I'd love to do that. So did did that for a while. I joined Mahesh very early on. So I grew with the team, buried the bodies, know where the bodies were buried, lived in sub-Saharan Africa for a while, setting up these laser boxes. That was awesome. And I think after doing it for a year and a half, I was like, okay, I really want to start my own thing. We all have Achilles heels. Mine is immigration. So it was tricky to figure out how to do that. But I was like, I could spend all of my time thinking about, well, once I raise money and once this happens, then I could do this or I can just quit. So I impulsively quit. There's the impulsive thing. That takes a lot of courage also. That might be one of your descriptive words. I I don't know if courage is the right word. It's poorly thought out decisions that in hindsight, could look smart. Most of them end up like leading to disaster. Um, yeah, anyhow, so I didn't want to be in the Bay Area just because I was like, I've been here for long enough. I'm literally a tech douchebag. I do the commute down to the South Bay. I live with my friends who are Twitter, Facebook. Like I'm dating folks who work in tech. Like I need to be a little bit more interesting. But I knew I had to be close enough to the Valley if I wanted this to succeed. Uh, and I thought Seattle was a great option. So how did you get introduced to... Allen Institute. Was trying to figure out, okay, now I have this idea. How do I get money? Uh, I knew the person who ran the Allen AI Institute. And I said, hey, can you introduce me to VCs in the area, right? You're connected to a lot of them. And he sat me down. His name's Oren. And he was like, look, Varun, you can go and raise some money. Maybe someone will give you a little bit, but you have no idea what to do with it. I'm like, well, that's kind of right. And he was like, you know, nothing about AI. I'm like, yep, that's also true. And he was like, why don't you come here as an entrepreneur in residence and we'll build a company around you. And more importantly, we'll teach you the art of company building and and we'll help you with your immigration situation. So you already had the idea when you came. Yes. And tell me about your co-founder and best friend. Yeah, Isha's awesome. We both did the Intuit internship together our sophomore year. We were both the youngest interns there. Everyone was trying to get their return offer, but we were going back to college. So we yeah. went past, became really good friends. She was at Apple in the Bay Area. I was at X. During COVID, we traveled with our group of friends, you know, doing the COVID digital nomad thing. We both wanted to start something. She's way more technical than I am. So I had the Udly idea. I was like, Isha, let's do this. And she was like, yep. So she left Apple, I left X, and we both moved up to Seattle and joined the Alania Institute as entrepreneurs in residence. And we're still here. 
Like they're I'm, still there. Yeah. I'm at their little room. Yeah. Or, Oren is incredible. He's um, one of my favorite leaders for sure. I love that you're there. And so tell our listeners once in frogs, you've been talking about Udly, like what Udly is and what's the strategy behind it? What's the thought behind it? Totally. Just on your previous point. Yeah. You know, Cause I think a lot of listeners here in the Seattle ecosystem Oren is you know, hands down one of the best people, not just leaders that I've ever worked with. He is funny and blunt and candid and just has his people's back and is the kind of leader that I want to be one day and is incredibly technical, but also business focused. I was once going through one of my usual emotional break- breakdowns and like, Oren, hug, like this isn't working and that isn't working and we have no focus and I have 10 irons in the fire and my board says we need to pick one thing. And Oren was like, Varun, it's simple. Pick the thing that's the most fun, spend 50% of your time on it. Pick the thing that's nearest to completion and spend 30% of your time on it. And then pick cool long-term things and spend 20% of your time on it. And I think Oren's approach to just ensure you're having fun at all times. Like Varun, you're not an enterprise sales guy. You don't understand it. It stresses you out. You want to build a big consumer product. I just go do that. Don't let other people tell you otherwise because you believe it'll be the most fun. And I just love that approach. I think that's the soundbite right there. I'm like, I want to take that away and tell every single entrepreneur to think like that. I've never heard that advice before. That's great. It depends. If we run out of money and it backfires, you can also blink. <laughs> I just think it's all about Oren's bad advice. I know. Yeah, no, you Maybe won't. You won't. We'll make sure of it. We're going to get the word out. We're going to make this go viral and everyone's going to download you, you like for sure. Cha-ching. Yeah. Done and done. Okay. So tell us what it is and also how you came up with the name. I'll start with the idea. It's simple. I mean, too many smart people struggle to speak with confidence. This is me before an investor presentation, freaking out and trying to memorize my slides. It's the kid in India who deserves a Sergey job more than me, but doesn't schmooze hard enough. It's the non-native English speaker, the immigrant, the engineer who's stuck in their job, not getting a promotion because their manager says they need to speak with confidence. It's the woman who gets talked over in corporate America. It's any of us talking to a mirror, a camera, a stopwatch. We've needed this at some point in our lives. We know 20 people who need it right now. When I was at X, I was working with a lot of executives and I became the de facto speech coach. I'm by no means an expert, but there are like five tricks when you're speaking, right? Speak in the rule of threes. Friends, Romans, countrymen, first, second, third, intro, middle, end, three little pigs, gold, silver, bronze, just do it, finger licking good. Like that's just a little strategy. Or when you speak, speak in alliterations. Well, at Udly, we hire for confidence, charisma, and capacity. It just sounds smarter when you say these things in alliterations. So I saw myself repeating the same thing over and over again, enforcing folks to record themselves and watch themselves and cringe, no matter how weird it was. Like, oh my God, I look like this. I have a pimple. I hate my life, whatever. Um, <laughs> And then through that process, I said, I think technology can help here and it can help millions, hopefully billions of people. So that's the idea behind Udly. It is Grammarly for speech. It is Duolingo for speech. It's Peloton or Strava for speech. It is your private real-time judgment-free speech coach that gives you feedback the way your friend, your spouse, your coach would. Like, Varun, slow down, make eye contact. Your joke didn't land. Shut up right now. Without you feeling judged. And the idea is use Udly to practice your salary negotiation, your interview prep, use Udly during your fancy podcast. How about a date? Use, I mean, that's my real vision, right? Like I'm on a date, Udly should be on my watch. It's only taking my voice and it should just say, Varun, shut up. Like ask her about herself. Stop talking about yourself. Yes. Um, It's the friend who kicks you under the table. Just being like, it's Isha at a board meeting with me saying, Varun, move away from this revenue slide, you are getting killed right now. Yes, 100%. So that's the tool. um, And that's the dream. And what's the business model? So it is a bottoms up consumer play. Let's get millions of consumers loving and using the tool, um, paying for the freemium version, and then enterprises buy bulk seats. Examples of that are consumers buying this for interview prep, speech prep, coaching on a day to day basis. But then large organizations, recruiting firms, for instance, offering this to all of their candidates to land jobs, um, coaching companies, giving this to folks for l and training, exec coaching, media training, sales coaching, career services centers and universities buying licenses for their students. Um, so it's consumer, but leading into enterprise. I, I, was, I mean, you may have just said this because my brain started, like my ADD kicked in. I started thinking about all the ideas I have for you. But did you say sales orgs? 
Yeah, you I did. didn't, but yes, there's a big market there. Huge market there. Um, I would love to listen to anyone doing sales and say, kind of, you, you came off cheesy or too aggressive, or um, you forgot to hit these key points. You didn't ask the client about themselves. They don't. You don't know anything about the client. Any, there's so many use cases, and then the dating apps. There's so many of them. All those people who put their presentations together. I have a couple single friends and we joke, like, I'm like, oh, let me swipe for you. And I'm like, these dudes, I'm sure that women, men are saying this about women too, but I'm like, these dudes are horrible. Like, I wish I could coach them on how to present themselves. <laughs> Seems like someone could analyze that. Anyway, it's it's kind of endless, the use cases. Totally. To the sales point, there's a really big market, but to be totally honest, that doesn't get me out of bed in the morning. There are enough folks helping sales teams. There are enough yeah. conversational intelligence tools. I want to bring that kind of coaching to the ordinary person who's doing sales on a day-to-day basis, like me right. convincing my manager for a raise or you ensuring your team listens to you without you forcing them. And I think there's a much bigger market there, but time will tell. And also probably um, aligns with your values around the giving back and making sure that people who are otherwise not, yeah, I, that makes sense to me. And so what are the most common use cases right now? And where are you directionally trying to take the business if you think about just short term 2024? Yep. Use case number one is public speaking. You have an upcoming speech presentation, pitch, come and practice with AI. So Toastmasters International, which is the world's largest speech coaching organization, has rolled this out to 300,000 members, millions of alumni, et cetera. The second is interview prep uh, for obvious reasons. The third is exec coaching, Nobody will have the guts to give me feedback to my face. Uh, I do these one-off workshops that aren't really helpful and don't have any ongoing retention. Um, And then the last is just folks who want to improve. Like I have been told I'm too soft or I've been told I interrupt people way too much. I don't know how to improve it. Now I can download Udly and use it on all of my calls and get reports on how I'm sounding. Um, And this is just my assistant at all times. It's kind of what you talked about. Mm -hmm. What I do like about it too is that it's confidential because some of these AI tools, uh, they're so intrusive and that it's private. It's not going to be recording the other, it's not going to be analyzing the other person, correct? Yes. And that's a strong product decision we've taken, right? Like I don't want a bot joining my call and for me to explain to, you know, my hiring manager. And by the way, I'm getting coached on my speech coaching because I'm insecure. Uh, Udly is like my personal trainer. When I meet someone, they're like, Varun, how did you get those six pack abs? And I'm like, ah, just worked out a little bit. Don't worry about it. I would never tell them about my trainer. That's Udly. Totally. We, we've built it in a way that it only takes your voice. So you don't need the other person's consent. It's completely private and it's both legal and ethical. Yes. And so do you get any pushback there? If there are people that are um, pushing back, what what are the uh, the obstacles that you're coming up against the biggest one is behavior change right people hate practicing they hate the sound of their own voice they don't have time for this they hate negative feedback Um, we're creating a new category that's hard the second is look i don't think ai is going to be at human level performance and that's not my goal it's also why i'm working with coaches around the world as their assistant right if they're the accountant we are turbotax But a lot of folks penalize us for saying, well, parts of your analytics are too tactical. Filler words don't matter. Or the context isn't over here. Or my emotion was different. And my answer to them was, yes, absolutely. Think of Udly as your report card or your thermometer. It'll give you diagnostics on how you've done, but go work with your doctor or your coach to figure out how to actually improve. I don't Mm -hmm. think technology should or can get the nuance to help you improve in ways that matter. So Tactics of feedback is a second piece. Um, and there are lots of like small techie things. Like we don't yet have a mobile app. That's an intentional decision. Um, we don't work in other languages. We're a tiny team. So we've got a lot of roadmap stuff to do. Mm-hmm. And what about competition? To be honest, the biggest one today is your bathroom mirror. That's where people go and practice. Uh There is nobody who is working on creating a category on speech coaching, at least to the best of my knowledge. Folks have done this in the sales world. Um, Folks have done this with written word, with Grammarly as an example, but it's just so hard to do. There's so much context and the technology is wicked tough. And is there any plan or, or do you do anything with visuals? Yes. So Udly gives you feedback on three elements. 
The first is computer vision, eye contact, body language, um, how you look, your centering on screen. So that's the visual piece. The second is your word choice. So that's natural language processing, your repetition, filler words, non-inclusive language, et cetera. And the third is your voice, your pitch. Did you have upspeak, vocal fry? Did you talk too fast? Were you too loud? Some of these are still being built, but those are the three components of feedback on your delivery. And then there's stuff on your content, structure, et cetera. And would it be ridiculous to go over into the category around polish, like physical, like what you're wearing or, you know, the the, clo- the colors were too loud or you probably shouldn't wear so much jewelry or, I mean, random things? It's a good question. I mean, the stuff we've been working with is, hey, your background is really confusing right now. I don't know if philosophically I want to go into critiquing. Right. It, it can take you into a kind of like, are we getting distracted? But I was just curious. Also, like I look like I've just woken up. I don't think I'm in any capacity to build a company to tell people how they should dress and look. Well, all that matters is that you sound incredible. And I think you look great. But thank yeah. you. So I'm curious if there if there are metrics and I am now on Udly and I'm trying to say, OK, I am giving myself a D and I'm trying to get to an A. Where are those metrics? Is there a certain pacing that's supposed to happen, a certain amount of um, filler words or when you're on the screen, where should you be standing? It, do you have all that? Or like, how, where do we know what we're going towards? Where does the North Star? So yes, we have thresholds for everything. Here's what typical conversational styles look like. One thing that's very important is we don't want to build robots, right? And shame on me if I make the kid in India talk like Steve Jobs. That is not success. Speaking, I speak pretty quickly, but I still think I come across as passionate and that's just fine. The idea with these thresholds is to make you aware of how you sound as opposed to forcing you to ascribe to a norm. As a result of that, Udly will give you numbers on how you've done, but Udly doesn't give you a score. And philosophically, I hope we don't go in that direction, right? If I tell the kid in India, you got a five out of five, the kid's going to go and say, great, Udly told me I was a five out of five. Why didn't I get the McKinsey job? Yeah. Instead, the same way a human would tell you, listen, you did a few things really well, you did a few things really badly, and here's what I would focus on. That's how we are structuring our feedback. And for individuals, who's the target or who's the most common? I have so many things going through my brain. I'm trying to hurry because I know we have a time limit, but I'm curious, like, are people who are your generation more receptive to this type of feedback or less? It's a good question. We've got hundreds of thousands of folks using the tool across all walks of life. I mean, we have users in over 150 countries. But if I were to point towards a bullseye ICP or ideal customer persona, it's I'm a non-native English speaker. I'm conscious of my accent. I grew up in China. I used to watch the show Friends on repeat and try to understand the subtitles before coming to the US because I was insecure. I've now come to the US. I likely did my undergrad in China. Uh, worked at a company there for two years. I'm now here. I did my master's program and I'm trying to break into a company like Accenture. Um, I might illegally record calls on the side and hear how I sounded relative to everyone else because I'm conscious of this. Udly is my coach. And I gave you a really vivid profile, um, not to stereotype, but because there are so many folks like this. And I picked on China as an example, but we've got folks with this same story. Could from, from anywhere in the world. Yeah. yeah. And um, tell me about how you've incorporated games. Yeah. I mean, look, my dream, to be honest, like forget all this speech coaching stuff. It's cute and fun. Is I just want people to have fun on Udly, right? Like come to Udly, have a great time and leave. Um, and we are dealing with a deep rooted human insecurity. The way we're going to solve that is not by like having you speak at 10 words per minute or not using any filler words. It's by just being confident and backing yourself. Um And it's a trick that every speech coach uses. They make you play these weird impromptu speaking games that you play in a comedy club. With the games, the idea is come and speak and you'll just get a score. Um, My hope is we build cards against humanity for speaking or Udly is truly successful if I can get introverted college kids to play Udly games as a drinking game. That's when we know they've overcome their fear. And that's why anytime you use the platform, you will see games front and center. And why, that's just to train you? Yeah, it's just be quick on your feet. Like the coolest people are the ones who just say smart stuff without thinking. Yes. Well, you're really good at that. 
Tell me about some of the partnerships that you're working on. Yeah, so in terms of partnerships, Microsoft is putting this out to 35,000 founders in their portfolio. Coursera has included it as part of their public speaking courses. Toastmasters is rolling out to 300,000 members globally. We have tens of thousands of speech coaches. Think of a speech coach as a sales trainer, a media trainer, a head of L&D, a freelancer, exec coach, um, an interview coach using it with their clients, hundreds and hundreds of universities using it with their career services teams. Um, so it's still early days, but it's exciting to see the traction, especially with enterprises. And yeah, for folks on this podcast here who are listening, feel free to go use Udly yourself. Go to Udly, upload one of your recordings, you'll get an analysis and you want to help your team get better, reach out and we'll set you up with a bunch of licenses. That's Udly.ai. Y-O-O-D-L-I. It's a weird name. How did you come up with the name? Oof. I'll give you the journalist story and then I'll give you the actual story. So the journalist story is, well, you know, Udly is a play on the word yodel, which is a kind of voice exercise. And it has the two O's and the L like Hulu, Google. It sounds techy. SEO was easy. The trademark was easy. That's the actual answer. The honest answer is I was, shoot, this is a podcast. It's okay. I was in college and I was really drunk one night and I told you about my roommate, Tyler, and I was looking for him and I was like, Tyler, where are you? You do, you do, you do. Oh. And then he just got more and more high-pitched and became, yes. So in my friend group, we, anytime we see each other, we just go, yes. In fact, when well, I heard of- it at the end of all your stuff too. It's at the very end. It was like, yeah, <laughs> It's my friend who recorded that because like we just do this for fun. Like when you're at a party and you're like, oh, is one of my homies here? Yeah. And then someone responds with, really? I think uh, your friend group sounds really fun. Yeah, no, no. We're all basically super nerdy and we are the only people we would hang out with. Anyhow, so when I started this company, I was like, I got to name it something that will get my friends to chuckle when they read about it. Um, so I remember we were in the Wall Street Journal in a pretty prominent article, which was bucket list. I saw that. Go, and, go. Um, no, no, no. This wasn't meant to be a brag. It's meant to be a story. No, but it is meant to be a, I get to brag. That's my job. But for so you. My friends called me and they said, I cannot be, believe grown adults who are quoting like CEOs of Microsoft are talking about Udly with a straight face. And I was like, let's go. You should be saying, let's go. That's incredible. 30 under 30 in the Wall Street Journal, the mm-hmm. TEDx talk. We didn't even get to talk about any of this. This is all the braggy stuff that I get to talk about for you on your behalf. And, um, like I can just say, I'm so glad that you came to Seattle to start this business. Um, we need more entrepreneurs like you. You make us super proud. And um, I'm curious for my last question for you, what fuels you? I mean, this, I, it sucks on a day-to-day. I'm taking face punches and, uh, you know, someone's unhappy at all times. And we've got to figure out the money piece. And I don't know if we're doing well or not. But heck, I really believe if we do this right, we can help millions of people speak with confidence. Uh, And I just want to keep doing that. Like, I'm not a serial entrepreneur who's going to do 10 of these and exit the business. I want to take this to the moon or to the ground. And I'm going to keep pushing. And I think our team will as well to do good in the world with this. Thank you for listening to the What Fuels You podcast. If you'd like to check out past episodes to hear from more business leaders, go to fueltalent.com backslash podcast. And if you have a minute, please leave a review and rating on your favorite podcast app or share this episode with a friend or colleague. Please share any feedback or interview suggestions for other guests by sending a message to podcast at fueltalent.com. I'm Shauna Swirland and thanks again for listening.